August 2nd, 2014, episode 61, The Time Has Come. Welcome, everybody, to another edition of the Beekeeper's Corner podcast. I want to welcome in this week Tim Schuler to the podcast. Tim is joining me. He is the New Jersey State Apiarist. Tim, thanks for coming along. Hey, Kevin, you're very welcome. So Tim is the State Apiarist. He's also a beekeeper in his own right and has a lot of hives, and I don't know anybody that gets to... Uh, do this type of of activity, Tim. You're in your bees all the time, and you're also visiting everybody throughout the state. So that's that's really kind of a cool thing that you do. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, Kevin. Um, my, my I started out beekeeping as probably a ten or eleven year old kid. Uh, I was helping my dad. My dad. We grew August up. Uh, 2014, episode 61. That's uh, Tim, we got this. Um, Welcome everybody. Coming today. through here. Let me see if we can figure out where that's coming from. No problem. Welcome in this week, Tim Schuler, to the pop. Ah, there we go. Okay. Had the uh, podcast loaded in the background. Sorry about that. Okay, go. All right. <laughs> I uh, I grew up. My dad always wanted to be a, become a beekeeper. He had a couple buddies or a buddy that was a beekeeper in Glen Olden, Pennsylvania. Uh, it was an old man that owned an auto body shop, and my dad loved honey and wanted to start beekeeping when I was probably 10 or 11 years old. So he started, uh, the beekeeper told him, look, if you build some bee equipment, um, and when I, when I get a swarm, I'll go ahead and give it to you, and you can put it in your bee equipment. Well, of course, he talked to my mom about it, and my mom was, like, not into it because we grew up in suburban Philadelphia. Yeah. And my brother was allergic to a lot of uh, pollen and ragweed. And she says, your son, your second son is allergic to this. We can't have honeybees. And my dad did what every good Pennsylvania Dutchman would do. He huddled up me and my brother. He says, don't tell your mother nothing. And we went out <laughs> in the shed every afternoon and we assembled all the bee equipment. And before we knew it, we had bees. I have many fond memories, Kevin, of me and my brother catching swarms that the neighbors would find, walking down the sidewalk with the swarm on a branch, shaking it into boxes in our backyard as we were just, you know, 12, 13-year-old kids. That that was my start, Kevin. That was my start. I yeah. um, was always fascinated by honeybees. Went to Delaware Valley College. Didn't study anything about honeybees. My major course of study was animal husbandry. I wanted to be a livestock producer. And once I graduated from there, I married my wife, moved to New Jersey, um, started working on a large farm. Um, I was kind of uh, living in farm housing, didn't really have time for bees then. But when we left that position and got, to work, got a job with the Department of Agriculture, my wife and I bought our own property, and that's when we started really doing it um, on our own. We started out with about three hives from a friend of my father's. And over the course of several years, was up to 25 or 30 hives. And starting in about 1991, we expanded up to about 200 hives and run roughly 2 to 220 um, now for pollination and honey production and have a nice little family sideline business going. Um, I continued to work in the Division of Animal Health with the Department of Ag. And then in 2006, when the honeybee crisis struck, um, there was a vacancy for the state APRS position, and my boss asked me, or my current boss asked me if I would be interested in taking it, because the the, the commercial beekeepers in the industry knew me and knew um, that I had my own bees and I had skin in the game, and they really liked that fact. And my boss also liked the fact that I had a good rep, a good. Um, rep, if you will, within the commercial industry, as well as the backyard industry. So um, in any case, as a, as a result of all that, Kevin, in 2007, I was hired in August as the New Jersey State APRs. How about that? I didn't, I didn't know the timing of all that, right? And I started keeping bees in 2008, and uh, you've just always been a fixture that's been there. So you have 200 hives, and I'm assuming they're not all on your property. You have them all over the place? 
I have them. I have I have about five holding yards that I winter bees in, but this time of year my bees are out on vegetable farms pollinating farmers' crops, and they pay they pay me for that service. Yeah. So, so give me a day in the life as uh, the state apiarist. What what are some of the things that you do? And I have to say, as I talk to you in your rounds. You put more miles on than anybody I know, just even going to beekeeping meetings, let alone what you do every day. Well, Patty and I were just at the Sussex County Fair yesterday, got home at about 10, 10 o'clock last night. We judged the, I judged the honey show. Uh, the mileage is really can be a drag at times, Kevin, to be quite honest with you, because it, it becomes boring, and then I eat to overcome the boredom <laughs> and that's why, that's why I'm the size that I am, to be honest with you. I know that story. <laughs> uh, a day in the life of Tim Schuler is, generally speaking, I have responsibilities for administrative work, reports, data entry on inspection reports, monthly reports generated to the managers that are above me, um, and, and every day is different. That's one of the nice things about this job, but, um, you know, I'll have, I'll have scheduled calls where people call me for assistance. If I can't solve their problems over the phone, then I go out and I make um, I make inspections. And it becomes a little bit of a – it can become difficult when someone has a desperate need for me, but they're three and a half hours away, and I have a week of things that are already scheduled. So that, that can sometimes be a bit of a drag. Uh, I was fortunate this season, this summer, because I had a young man from Rutgers University as well as an old fixture in the New Jersey beekeeping industry called Bob Hughes and the two of those guys both worked with me and took some of the burden off from North Jersey uh, inspections. Yeah, so um, Bob Hughes, he's been working with you for a long time and you're in South Jersey, you're almost uh, what parallel to Atlantic City and for you to go to Sussex and even up to our area is uh, it's quite a haul for you to go all over the place. It's de it's definitely a haul, and I try, Kevin, to work with beekeepers and line up multiple visits in the same general area so that that time can be well spent as opposed to just going up for one uh, one inspection and not have anything else to do up there. That, that's why I like having a good rapport with the different branches of the New Jersey Beekeepers Association because oftentimes they will... Uh, query their members and say, hey, Tim's coming up on this day. Um, if you want an inspection or you have issues, then let's 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 make a big loop and one of the members of the club will lead me around so we can do it efficiently um, and really save taxpayer dollars, to be honest with you. Yeah, so we're sitting here at the, at the juncture of the most important time of the year for beekeeping in my consideration. It's July, August, this is the time you really need to be testing for your mites and checking, and we've been trying to deliver that message out to everybody, and I'm sure you have too. There's no doubt about it, Kevin. Uh, the Varroa mite is public enemy number one to the beekeeping industry as far as I'm concerned, and as far as most people that do conduct any kind of bee research are concerned. And effectively controlling them at the right time of the year is, is critical to overwintering colonies of honeybees especially in the north. So this is a time of the year where you have to check and see if you have the right thresholds and if you do you're going to treat. And what I keep emphasizing to people, even the non-treatment people, <laughs> is that you have to test and if you have mites they will make your bees sick, the ones that are going to overwinter, right? The next couple crops that are going to go through that the queen is going to lay and late August, early September, and going into that first frost. And it's really important right now because if you're not doing that, and how many people tell you they lose their hives over winter? And really it's because they were dead men walking going in because they weren't treated properly. No doubt about it. And here's the issue, Kevin. Uh, the monitoring is wonderful. But think about it. If you're doing an alcohol wash or a powdered sugar roll or um, um, even just uh, trapping natural mite fall, um, people all the time have never seen varroa mites, and they tell me that they didn't treat because they didn't see any. Think about it. You're, you're looking at 300 bees out of a colony of honeybees if you're doing an alcohol wash, powdered sugar roll, or um, an ether roll, and, 
and if you don't look at the right 300 bees, your test is going to be really skewed. For example, and, and we even did this, Alex and Bob and I did this this spring. Um, you took samples of bearded bees on the front of the hive, a sample of bees from under the inner cover, a sample of bees off of honey. Found no varroa mites, but when we went into the open brood, which is where varroa mites love to hang out, because what does a varroa mite want to do, Kev? He wants to re she wants to reproduce. Yeah. So she's hanging out by open brood. And if your sample is not collected off of open brood, the chances of you finding a varroa mite plummet. Um, we would find five or six mites out of 300 bees off of open brood, yet any of those other locations I just mentioned, Kevin, we would find no mites. So the, the place that you sample is critical. And being able to see them, I mean, a guy like me, I even use a magnifying glass at times because it's, it's very important to be able to identify what's going on. And a lot of times beekeepers uh, tell me they didn't have any mites back in July or August. And as far as I'm concerned, every hive that's out there has got varroa mites to one degree or another. Then they call me up. Their bees are dead in, in January 1. And what do I see when I go out there? A handful, a fistful size of bees. Um, no other bees in the hive. Uh, an inch and a half, two inches from honey. Yeah. Plenty of honey in the hive. And when I, when I sample what's on the bottom board or sample bees in that cluster, they're loaded with varroa mites. So, you know, I quite frankly think prophylactic treating is a very important thing if you want to be successful. So what do you say to the people who started this year, Tim, the ones that started with packages or did some splits and theoretically they shouldn't have the mite loads? Are you still an advocate of treating them or at minimum they have to test, don't you think? At minimum they have to test, Kevin. I'm a strong advocate if it's a split this year or a nuke made up that did not is not producing honey. There's nothing wrong with slipping an apivar strip in there. It, it isn't temperature dependent. It will not overpower the colony, and it will knock mites down to a, to a large degree, and enable that colony to go into the winter relatively mite free. The thing we didn't discuss yet, Kev, is the fact that how varroa mites kill colonies over the winter is the nurse bees, if they've been parasitized while they were developing as a pupa their hypopharyngeal glands don't get properly developed. So the brood food they feed the next generation of bees is, is not as good as it should be. Yeah. And instead of, instead of the colony developing long-lived winter bees, they have short-lived summer bees going into winter. And that's a recipe for disaster. Interesting. So it was a relatively cool, um, a relatively cool temperature week this week in New Jersey. Good to do Apigard or some of these other ones that aren't as volatile in really hot temperatures, but next week temps are going to go up, humidity is going to go up, and one of the things I hear from you and I tell people all the time is your treatment has to be predicated on what you're facing in the next week during that initial treatment period especially, and you have to pick the right product for what you're trying to achieve and for what the temperature is you're looking at. That's absolutely right, Kevin. We have we have pretty good tools now, um, and it's important for beekeepers to understand which tool has which application. As I as I told you before we came online live, I was out checking bee yards today, weed whacking. Um, it's kind of drizzly and nasty down here in South Jersey today. Um, there's colonies that the honey's already been removed. Uh, we slipped an ape of our strip in them because honey has to be off before that is, is, is applied. The colonies that still have honey are going to get mite away quick strips because, as you already said, this is perfect weather to put a mite away quick strip on. Um, the formic acid will not vaporize that quickly, and it does a very good job of knocking down adult, adult mites and supposedly is going to penetrate the cell and sterilize the males. Um, other colonies that have the, the, all the honey harvested, I can certainly go ape a guard if I desire to do that. Two treatments, 14 days apart. I, I've had a lot of success with Epigard. I, I like that product. Um, I've also done splits, and in the past I've done powdered sugar treatments, but that seems to have fallen out of favor. Uh, 
I have all new hives this year, so I'm, I'm going to go in and monitor tomorrow and see what my thresholds are and figure out what my treatments are going to be. The issue that, uh, as you may as you may know, Kevin, and we talked about this before, is I go to, uh, we have a lot of name, um, big named researchers come and speak at different meetings in our state, and every one of them I ask them, what is your threshold for treating for Varroa? And it's interesting because everybody's threshold is different. Yeah. This year, I we submitted some samples that were damaged, of, of colonies that were damaged after blueberry pollination to the Bee Informed Partnership. And the report came back um, to the beekeeper that submitted them, and their recommendation was um, two mites per hundred bees, um, you should consider treating five mites per hundred bees, your colony is probably going to collapse in the near future. So that was the first time I heard thresholds that low, which I thought was um, was very interesting. Yeah, you know, Randy Oliver was here at one point, and he was telling us about the thresholds that he does. And, you know, what stuck with me is he takes a look in the spring, and he knocks them down if he has to. And then he looks a little further in late spring and early summer and midsummer, and he's just adjusting those treatments, and he's doing a constant monitor to keep the thresholds down. I, I mean, Randy's a commercial guy. He's not a backyard guy, right? So he's got different objectives. He's trucking his bees places and doing whatever. But um, to me, it just seems like if you could keep that threshold down and keep the viruses out of your hive and things like that, that seems to be the direction to, to go in. Um, I, I would love to. So let's, let's ask this topic, Tim. There are people who have somehow succeeded in being treatment free. Yes. They are, but they either got the right genetics, they have the right yard where they're not interspersing with their neighbor's hives, something's going on, they're running ferals, something's going on. But generally, anybody that I talk to across my sphere of influence, they're finding mites and they have to treat. And I've said this, you know, your recommendations, and you're in one corner of New Jersey to the other, and I, I'm pretty positive you understand what the mite loads are here. And I don't know how it is in Indiana or Missouri or Kansas or wherever these people are that uh, D. Lusby treatment free. I, I've just wondered, do you think the density of uh, beekeepers in New Jersey has an impact on this? Well, there's no doubt there's been a tremendous increase in the number of people that keep bees in New Jersey. Just since I've been in this position, Kevin, over 2,500 people taking the, one of the beginner beekeeping courses that I teach, let alone Cape May County, uh, Sussex County, uh, uh, Essex County, they all have their own beekeeping courses that they offer to people. And there's a lot of people that just start keeping bees without ever taking any kind of a class. So you know, the actual number that, of beekeepers that has increased in New Jersey since 2007 is probably, you know, three three to four thousand I would imagine. Um, beekeeping is very much people are, are totally into it. Um, now there's a, a gentleman that I'm friends with in, in Cumberland County and he is a treatment free beekeeper. Um, one of the, the questions that I ask people that don't treat or don't use any sort of a, a chemical treatment is what kind of a winter death loss are you can you live with and in some instances it's 35-40% I can't live with that kind of a loss in my own operation. Right. The, other, the other thing that is a treatment that most people don't consider a treatment, Randy Oliver brought this point out when he came and spoke when Northwest Jersey beekeepers hosted that meeting, is if you take a colony in the spring, an overwintered colony, and divide it up into five or six nucleuses, you decreased the varroa population by five or six times. So that, in effect, is a treatment. And one of the things that kind of frosts me a little bit is when people that sell nucleuses tell people they don't treat, but all they do is sell nucleuses and they divide them up six ways. They actually do treat because right. they take the varroa load and divide it by six or reduce it by a factor of six and then sell it to other beekeepers who in turn don't do anything to control varroa mites and end up losing their bees. I think that's kind of dishonest, to be honest with you. Yeah, I, I agree with you. You know, and we had this conversation where we talked to our beekeepers in the spring and we said, you start with two mites and they'll tell two friends and they'll tell two friends and by the end of the summer you're going to have a certain load. And then you overwinter and, and then you come back into spring 
and you start with four mites or six mites or eight mites or whatever it is. Multiply them across that pattern, and by the end of the summer, your hive collapses. So I think people need to get the concept of new hive, second-year hive, third-year hive on two fronts. The mite load, and, and I agree with you, splitting is a technique, right? In the past, I got away with not treating my bees because I was making splits of my hives, right? But the other side of this is how good is your queen? I, I, I think we need to deliver better messages about you get to the second year of your queen or, or certainly the third year, it's time to replace them. And I don't know anybody that's doing that as a practice around here. Kevin, most commercial beekeepers are doing that because they realize exactly what you said. That And actually, this past year, some of the commercial beekeepers from New Jersey have marked colonies that had the overwintered queen in it and find that they, they're the ones that peter out uh, middle of May, end of May, and they would have been better off making up their death loss, splitting colonies, and requeening those colonies so they had a young, vigorous queen heading the colony. Uh, there's no doubt about that. That That is an issue. So we talk about raising nukes in our yards and all that stuff, Tim, but I, I have to wonder if people should start getting into uh, populating their queens, right? Every time you see the queen cell, pull that out, put it in a, in a mating box or something like that. It, one of the other things I wanted to ask you about is swarms in New Jersey. We're tracking the swarms, and last year uh, we're at right now where we were at the end of last year, uh, number-wise. And when I look at the map, which I have on my screen over here next to me, it runs from the top edge of New Jersey to the bottom all the way through, uh, swarms are being reported. Um, it, it's just universal across the state. Yeah. Um, Did you see uh, a lot of swarms this year? What was your, your thought on that? I well, seem to think it's low, even though it was a great year for bees. In my own operation, the swarming was much lower than it was in the previous year. Um, Kevin, I think... Um, I can't prove this scientifically, but I believe as the mite levels increase, we see more swarming. Um, I, I can't speak to it throughout the whole state of New Jersey, but in my own operation, the way I manage things, um, I had much less swarming this year. Um, swarming, too much swarming, certainly impacts my honey crop. and it, it, I'll have a much better crop of honey if I keep the queens in their colonies and keep them brooding up. So um, I know beekeepers in New Jersey, especially newer beekeepers, and I, I don't know that this has ever been written in a book, but if they're running a double deep colony, they have no drawn comb and honey supers, all the time they're put a queen excluder on and a box of foundation over it, and generally speaking, most of the time, bees will not move through that queen excluder to work foundation. They'll only go through to, to store honey and drawn comb. And what happens is they plug out the second deep, they start making swarm cells, they fly the coop, the beekeepers bummed out because they get no honey this year, and their colony is in the process of requeening itself. And it's kind of a drag, but they just don't they just don't know that. Yeah. Yeah, I have a lot of people ask me about queen cells and, and uh uh, queen excluders and all that, and I, I don't see any purpose to them except when you're doing something where you're trying to isolate the queen for a management technique. Um, but one thing I wanted to, to tell you, I, I bought some queens this year. It's the first time I bought bees, but Stan was able to get me Sue Kobe queens, and I wanted some carniolan stock in my uh, yard again. I put one in. It took, it went... Uh, it started laying eggs and it had some larvae and then I went in the next time and that queen was gone. Hmm. That was really weird, right? But there was enough bees that had been generated from her getting started that they made a queen cell out of one of the eggs. So the queen hatched. She got started. I found her. She looked great. She started laying again. There was a full frame of brood in there. And I went in the hive today, and it's completely empty. There's nothing in it. Really? You ever hear that? That's kind of strange, isn't it? Like, I'm wondering if the nectar flow is gone, and maybe they didn't have any stores. And I, I don't know what, have, what would be the case for that. Hmm. 
Kevin, I wish I could not tell to put you on the spot. But wow, my I, just, I, I went and looked at that, and I've been thinking about it all day. Like, what the heck happened here? That's really weird, isn't it? The more, the more I, the longer I keep bees, the and and people want to think everything's black and white. Let me tell you, it's a biological organism, and it isn't black and white. I just had a guy tell me yesterday he had a he had a colony that he put a queen in. And he went there to look at it today. The queen he put in is marked on one side of the frame. Flip the flip the frame over, and there was another queen laying on the other side of the frame that wasn't marked in the same <laughs> eye. So you know, weird stuff happens, Kev. I don't I do I don't know why really. Yeah, I mean, you know what? So one of the things I've done this year, Tim, is I've always had two, three, four, up to five hives. I have 12 hives out in the yard right now, and what I'm really after is just if I'm going to have losses over winter, at least I can recover with maybe six. I, I can't lose all of them. Uh, you know, my expectation is I'll bring half or, or more of those in, and really what I'm looking for is I just need to keep something going every year. So not that I'm starting from scratch, but it just feels like I, I want to be able to have uh, bees to do splits and bees to make honey and I, I don't know if you know what I'm doing. I think I've told you in the past I'm I'm experimenting, right? So I have a styrofoam hive, I have an A-frame hive, I have a medium hive. I put in a top bar this year. I want to learn all the form factors, right? And I just have always been in a poverty of bees. So this year I made a bunch of hives, and um, I'm having a blast. I think it's great. I get into this thing where I don't know. You tell me. You you have all these hives. Going in all these hives, it's a lot of work. <laughs> I've been working all day just, just weed whacking bee yards because the, the weather was no good. Popping lids, seeing what's going on. Uh, there's no doubt, Kevin, it's a lot of work. And if you don't like doing it, it's probably not for you. Um, you know, I will tell you the, the more you keep, the more you have to fine hone your skills so that you can you can figure out what's going on with much less time spent in the hive. Otherwise, there's no way you could keep as many as I keep. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that, that's critical. I, I have to say to you, I was going to term this episode Mistakes Were Made, right? Because one of the things that I know as a podcaster and talking, I'm, I still consider myself a novice, even though I have a lot of research in my background. Um, I make mistakes and people don't always agree with my techniques and things that I say or whatever, but that's good because they form opinions and they figure out how they want to keep bees and maybe it's not the way I keep bees. And so maybe I drive people to opinions and. I, I don't know, it's just this philosophical thing running through my head about beekeeping. It definitely keeps you thinking all the time and on your toes. Kevin, I tell people now when we start the beginner beekeeping class that beekeeping is a thinking person's hobby. If you cannot make decisions and you cannot evaluate what's going on in front of you and make decisions about that, it may not be for you because you have to make decisions. You have to think about what's going on. When I drive around, I'm thinking about bees. When I'm driving from your apiary to somebody else's apiary, I'm thinking about bees. I might be thinking about your bees or I'm thinking about my bees. But I'm, I'm thinking about bees. I'm thinking about ways to make things better. Kevin, people ask me all the time, well, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? I don't have every type of beehive made like you do. I know what works for Tim Schuler, okay? Yeah. And that's what I stick with. Um, if, if something else worked better and it could be proven to me, I might change some of my operation, but you know, I, I, as you well know, I've been to Haiti, I've been to Africa, and I've worked with beekeepers there. Most of those people would love to have Langstroth equipment, but in America, a lot of people are moving away from Langstroth equipment, and I sit there and I wonder, <laughs> I wonder why, to be honest with you, yeah. because yeah. third world people would love to have the ability to have the type of modern beekeeping equipment you and I have at our fingertips. Yeah, for me, I'm I'm just interested in um, what the differences are, and I can see the eight-frame hive is a little bit different than the ten-frame hive. How they built the the frames out and how they operate. Um, I also see a lot of bearding, so the temperatures must be different. That hive is always bearding more than some of the other ones, so it's just just interesting. At some point, I'm five years in, right? And most people that I know of that are stable beekeepers. They're in their sixth, seventh, eighth year. They've had enough experience, seen enough. Um, I learn every time I go out, Tim, and uh, even 
We went to the uh, Northwest meeting at Leary's house, and you did the, you found the drone layer, and we shook the bees out. Whatever I had never experienced that, so I thought that was a pretty neat lesson. And uh, you just always have to keep your ears and eyes open and see what's going on because there's so much to learn. Kevin, I'm learning stuff. I learn stuff every year. Um, there was a couple things I learned this past spring. I can't think of it to to to, to tell it to you, but. Um, off the top of my head, but I, I'm always looking to learn. If you do something better, if if you, one of the be the blessings of my job is I get to see how everybody else does stuff, and I'm not a creative person in any way, shape, or form. But I can steal an idea that works great for you if I think yeah. it'll work great for me, and put it into my operation to make my operation more efficient. And I'm all about that, Kev. I, I'm totally a okay with that. One of the things I wanted to touch base on when you were talking queens is a great tool, and a lot of beekeepers don't use them. A great tool for beekeepers is these queen castles. Okay, when you come across a colony that's wanting to swarm, or when you come across multiple queen cells in a colony, and a great thing to do is to pull a couple frames out of that colony with the cell, drop it in a queen castle, which is essentially a deep Langstroth hive body with four compartments in it that hold two frames each sitting on top of a strong colony to help regulate its temperature and humidity. You throw a couple frames in there, the queens emerge, they get mated, and now you've got a queen that came out of your own operation available for you to use if you have a drone layer, if you have a colony that goes queenless, if you have anything like that. And it's just a great tool, and they're relatively cheap, Kevin, to have sitting in your bee yard, um, and, and then you have a queen whenever you need it. Do you put those on a queen excluder, Tim, or do you have a solid bottom on those? It, it, it's not a solid bottom, Kevin. It, the, the one that Brushy Mountain makes has a wooden bottom with slats in it that a, that a bee cannot go through. But it allows moisture, it allows humidity and warmth to come up and regulate the temperature of that queen castle. I, I'm pretty interested in that. And as I said, I, I went and marked all my queens. They're green this year. And... Since I know how old they are, my my objective is the second year I'm going to replace them. I will not go with three-year queens. And the way that I'm going to do that is because I have a number of hives, I'm going to take some of those and pull some. I'm going to let them get to swarm state, build some queen cells, and pull them out and do exactly what you just said. And that's how I'm going to do my queen replacement program. And I'm keeping the stock that's in my yard. Yeah, that, there's nothing wrong with that, Kevin. And... Um, Queen Castle is a great tool as far as I'm concerned, and it's a tool that not a lot of beekeepers use. So, Tim, you, you do honey and you do pollination. Can you talk a little bit about how much honey you make? And take us through a pollination. I don't think a lot of people understand what that's like, like who you work with. You're down where the blueberries are? Yeah, my first pollinations every year are, are blueberry farms, and I have several growers that get bees from me every year. Um, we've developed relationships with these people over time. The one, the one young man he even hires my son and a bunch of his buddies to work in the packing house when they're packing blueberries. And I mean, it's a no joke operation. They're they're probably running 75, 80 acres of of high bush blueberries that are hand picked and packed and shipped all over the world. Um, so, generally speaking, once the Bradford pears drop their petals. I start getting a little squirrely because I know it's almost time to move bees for pollination. Kevin, I winter my bees on regular bottom boards, but I move my colonies on six-way pallets. A six-way yeah. pallet means six hives on a pallet. And I have a bobcat that I go in with forks on, pick them up, put them on the, on the truck, and we go ahead and haul them up to the blueberry farm, um, set them off in a couple of main drops where... Uh, they fly out and they pollinate that crop. Um, the large part of what I do with all the farmers I rent bees to, Kev, is talking to them about uh, being careful with pesticide applications. And uh, my main blueberry farmers, they all they all spray after dark when the bees stop stop flying, and that's huge because fungicide applications are necessary to have a marketable crop. But there's new there's more um, more papers written that talk about different fungicides and their additives or their spreaders that can be, can, can be a problem. So 
uh, talking to growers and educating them about the issues that beekeepers face and asking them to exercise, you know, do whatever they can for the three or four weeks the bees are there, even if they have to work through the night so they don't, you know, impact them is a great thing. And I've had, I've had good results doing that. Yeah, we, we uh, recently, a couple activities in that way, and you know one of them we have coming up here in December. Uh, we were on a, a garden show recently, WDVR, which is a local radio station here where I live. And then we went to the farmer's dinner that night and had a booth and, and talked to people about that. And then, as you know, we're going to go speak to the Agricultural Society here uh, in our region and talk to them about the importance of native pollinators, beekeepers, and these things. And and I agree with you. You know, you're hearing this stuff come out of Penn State with the Frasers and how much these uh, synergistic effects and other things are impacting the bees. And having that dialogue is really important. And I have a farmer right next to me that maintains cornfields. They're, what, 10 feet from my hives. And Anytime he's doing anything, my phone rings and he lets me know, and that's because we have a good relationship. You know what I mean? Yeah, and that, that's key. You got to be you got to be realistic, and you got to work with people, and they got to work with us. The thing I try to say to growers is, we all got to make money. If the beekeeper doesn't stay in business, then they're not they're not going to they're not going to make a crop, especially if it's blueberries or certain vegetable crops. Uh, it's gotten to the point where several of of the growers I work with in the Vineland area actually plant buckwheat for my bees to forage on in September because we generally don't have a fall nectar flow even though they're paying me to put bees in to pollinate their crop buckwheat produces nectar for just a couple hours every day and it's just a good balance it gives the bees a natural food source to help stay strong on and the the farmers are starting are, are getting that so uh, the other thing is several of my farmers have worked with the Farm Service Agency from the U.S. government, and they have been putting in these what they call pollinator hedgerows, where they set aside a certain amount of ground. It gets seeded with plants that um, are perennial that will produce nectar and pollen during the, the dearth time of the year to benefit pollinators, not just honeybees, but butterflies, native pollinators, bumblebees, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. And it's, it's it's important for them to do that. Yeah, and that's one of the messages we want to deliver in December when we talk to them is, uh, you know, the study from Canola where they planted three-quarters of the field and left pollinator strips, and they even got more yield out of that. Um, so, Tim, isn't it that uh, are honeybees the right pollinator for blueberries? I had heard differently that it was, that it was bumblebees, but, you know... Um, Honeybees will do it, but they're not the most effective. Just curious well, about that. Well, a bumblebee is an excellent pollinator because it goes out with no reserves, and if it doesn't find something, it's not coming back. Bumblebees will fly before honeybees, and they fly later in the nut in the evening than honeybees. But the problem is they're not manageable like honeybees, Kevin. Um, and you know, a bumblebee nest might have 80 adults in it, whereas a honeybee colony would have 50 to 60 thousand a strong. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Honeybees do a better job just because of their uh, sheer numbers and because of the fact that they're manageable. Um, some some growers like to have a balance of both. They'll they'll push up brush around the perimeter of their fields so the bumblebees can naturally nest there, but then have honeybees. Because imagine you know 200 acres or 500 acres of blueberries. There's not enough nest sites in the middle of that field, and bumblebees tend to not forage as far away from their home nest as honeybees do. So there's definitely uh, both of the, they both behave differently and they both are an asset to the grower. That's that's a good point, right? Cuz they talk about the, you know, honeybees will fly a lot farther than several native pollinators. That's true. So in uh I got a question on Reddit this week about single source honey. Do you know how big a field has to be where you set a bees in for it to be considered single source? You happen to know the answer to that? I know. Uh, I can tell you what commercial beekeepers generally do. They will they will pull the honey off of the supers um, before they move into a pollination. They don't strip the brood nest, but they strip the pull the supers, put empty supers on, and then most of what 
comes in would be labeled blueberry honey or cantaloupe honey or clover honey, something along those lines. Is it 100%, Kevin? It's not 100%. Because uh, honeybees are opportunists, and if for some reason the blueberries shut off, they'll go get something else if it's if it's close enough. Right. But I I can't tell you what that what that what what the number you're looking for. I don't How is know. that blueberry honey? Is it good? Yeah, blueberry. It's it's a relatively light amber honey. Got a nice flavor to it. Yeah. Do you pollinate any other crops besides blueberries? I mean, that's a dominant thing down in your area. Yeah, after blueberries, we generally have about a three-week lag time, and then guys that are growing squash and cucumbers and pickles are starting to call for bees, maybe three to four weeks. And then I have a couple of fellows that grow seedless watermelon and cantaloupes, and um, I generally don't do pickles. Mostly it's, it's vine crops, uh, cucumbers, pickles, squash, um, and melons. I do have one grower that is a cranberry grower, um, and I've taken care of him for about 20 years, and we have a good relationship as friends, you know, over and above, uh, you know, the, the, the two businesses. Very cool. So, Tim, you have a, a national and international audience, but you definitely have New Jersey beekeepers here. This time of year, what are you trying to tell folks? What should they be doing? Uh, they need to be making sure they have food reserves. They need to be making sure that their varroa levels are low, um, and they need to get their treatments on. Honey needs to be pulled. Treatments need to be, be put on so that you have non-parasitized bees raising the generation that's going to take your colonies through the winter. Have you seen any bear problems this year? Any uh, reports? It seems to be a little, little slower this year. I haven't heard a lot of stories about them. I have not heard a lot of stories about them. Uh, other than our, the editor of our newsletter had issues last fall and also this spring. Um, I'm getting nervous about bears, Kevin, because the last two or three years we've seen uh, there's been bear sightings all around where I live. Two years ago, two summers ago or springs ago, there was a bear running through the downtown Vineland for crying out loud. Yeah. <laughs> One of these days I'm going to be in the same boat that my friends are up in Sussex and Warren counties where there's no way that I'll be able to keep bees without a bear fence. And I'm already starting to think about that and start to talk to the landowners that I keep bees on, at least winter bees on, to um, to begin to, that I'll be able to start putting in corner posts and being prepared so that I can deal with it. I mean, it would be devastating for me to have a bear go through in October as the bees were getting ready to go into winter and take out 70 or 80 colonies in a bee yard. Yeah. That would totally destroy me, Kevin. Well, I don't, I don't know if I've chatted with you lately, but last year I know I told you I had a bear literally across the street at the farm. I didn't realize somebody told me there was a bear at the farm, and I didn't know the name of the farm because I didn't grow up here. But uh, a couple weeks ago, one of the farm operations about a mile as a crew flies, um, and I said this on the podcast, uh, I'm planning a bear fence. Like, outright, I've got all the... The material set up, and I'm at the cusp of ordering everything because it was walking the perimeter of the fence, and they have they have bees in there because they do melons and squash and all that stuff. They're a huge farm operation, and um, I, I'm at the point where I have no choice. There's two strikes, and <laughs> the next one's going to come and get me. So uh, I I was out today, just like you, uh, weed whacking the bee yard and looking at where I'm going to put everything and getting things set up um, it, it's a it's a big expense but it's far cheaper than replacing all your hives and, and you know what Kevin it, replacing beehives is so demoralizing to a beekeeper I mean you know if, if it's it, especially when it's death loss due to me not properly managing Varroa but to have a bear come through and totally devastate the operation when everything else is is right online is just heartbreaking I you know I, I I'd be speechless. Yeah. So, Tim, if you ever listen to our podcast or just hear me and Bob Kloss talk back and forth, um, we get on these uh, tangents. <laughs> and one of the things we're talking about is next year our game plan is to go and try and feral hives in New Jersey. Any guidance you have for us on that? To try and find them? Find them. There's got to be forests with feral hives in New Jersey. That That has to be true, don't you think? 
no doubt about it. Um, there's beekeepers, actually Deborah Delaney, the researcher, Dr. Deborah Delaney from the University of Delaware is doing research where she actually genetically analyzes bees from feral colonies. And a couple of years ago, I, I was, I, I, I sent an email out to beekeepers in New Jersey and said, look, if you know where there's any feral colonies, I'd like to sample them, send the, send the samples down to Deborah Delaney. It's part of her research. Um, and pff, Cape May County and Sussex County both responded greatly. And I went up and collected a half a dozen samples in each of those areas and sent them down to Deborah. They were colonies living in trees, living in buildings that beekeepers knew or someone knew had been there for multiple years. Um, are they there? They're definitely there. Um, and, and in some instances, Kevin, I know for a fact they've survived multiple years because I actually went and checked them every year, every spring to make sure they made it through the winter and it yeah. wasn't a swarm that reseeded uh, empty comb. But in some instances, it's colonies died out and it's swarms that moved back in. And so it's not necessarily, doesn't necessarily mean that their genetics is superior, I guess is my point. Yeah, so one of the things we're talking about is building swarm traps in the poles to strap them up to a tree and go find places that are target areas. You, you look at Sussex County, they have so much in the way of woods and stuff up there that that seems logical, but I don't know anybody up there. It would be interesting to try and find some sites and see if we can catch something. And to Deborah's point and to uh, Dr. Seeley's point, put them up high and uh, see if we can keep any of the swarms from ground level uh, apiaries from occupying these, but true ferals get them in a box, you know? Well, the way Dr. Seeley did it, as you probably know, is he put an ad in the newspaper and offered to pay people 20 bucks or 10 bucks if they showed him where there was a feral colony and he was allowed to cut it down and, and dissect it. Uh, that was back in the 70s. You might have to pay him a little more to get it to happen yeah. now, but you know, that, that was an interesting way to do it, Kevin. So let me ask you a couple, I have a couple things that I had queued up here and I wanted to just run them and you, you may know nothing about it or you may have all the insight that I never expected. One of them is, if you hear of stinging nettle and using that for a formic acid treatment, did you know that if you crush it and, and leave it, it gives off formic acid naturally? I didn't know that, Kevin. I've heard of stinging nettle. Um, I, I do know in some bee yards that I have when I unload bees coming out of blueberry pollination and set them down, if the weeds are tall, the bees get extremely irritated by certain weeds when they're crushed. Is it stinging nettle? I don't know. Um, the, my whole thing with, you know, people ask me, well, what if I plant mint all around my apiary? Will that be enough to control varroa mites? I got no way to answer that. The things that I know that, that control them have a set concentration, a set volume. Yeah. Set time, so I would I would be uh, I would be speculating if I tried to answer that. I had someone write in and tell me that they uh, um, catnip is an effective thing also against mites and against more I think more explicitly um, it was hive beetles, and you could plant that and walk around on it and it releases the volatile oils all over the place and. Yeah. I, I'm waiting for somebody to come back and say volatile oils is the answer and you could use lavender and things like that to control all this, but if it were true, somebody probably would have figured these things out already. Yeah, I, I don't know. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of people, Kevin, doing bee research, but I think we could use a lot more doing bee research as well. Yeah, so I, I did a um, feature two episodes again ago on uh, my treatments and I talked about Apa, which one? Apistan? No, I talked about Mitaway quick strips and how to use it. But what I haven't talked about is Apigard and Apivar. And I know uh, you've you've done a couple sessions on those recently and can probably talk about those. Uh, Apigar, pretty simple. It's just a tin, put it in two treatments, you don't want to do it when it's really hot, the bees will remove it, um, follow the instructions, not not a difficult product to work with, right, Apigard? But two things, Kevin, about Apigard. 
If you're running screen bottom boards, you want your screens closed, you want your entrance open, and you want to make sure you have a spacer rim so that the bees have access to the ape of guard because they try to remove it from the colony. And I think it's important that they have access to that. Um, so last year I had several people tell me, Tim, I did exactly what you said. You told me to treat for varroa mites. I did it and all my bees died. What do you say to that, Kevin? Um, so this is what I said. I said, well, explain to me how you keep your bees. Do you use screen bottom boards? Oh, yeah, I use screen bottom boards. Did you close them before you put your mic control on? Uh, no, I didn't. I didn't know I had to do that. I said, well, the labels say that on both Mite Away Quick Strips as well as Apa Guard as yeah. well as Apa Life Var. So they did not follow the label directions, and that was a huge issue. They did not get good control because the Mite Away Quick Strip vaporized or the Apa Guard vaporized, dropped right out of the bottom of the hive, and did not do what it was intended to do. Yep, I, I emphasize every time I may not be all-knowing on these products, but there's one clear thing to do is read the label. There you go. <laughs> you know? I got to read the label every year, too. To read the label. I don't, make, I don't make a mistake. Yeah, if you, even if you, I, I don't know, um, I have Lyme's disease right now, so I'm taking doxycycline. I read the label. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's not complicated, I don't think. <laughs> it's not rocket science. Yeah. I, I think the thing that gets people in trouble at minimum with these treatments, though, is, is temperature, right? It says you can go to 95 degrees. If you put this stuff on when it's 90 degrees, it's going to gas your bees. I'm sorry. I, I don't know anything that I would put on above 85 with high humidity. I just wouldn't do it. Yeah. Um, definitely the, the mite away, it, you want it to be down in the 80 range, low 80 range, um, raining for a couple days. Those are all good things in my personal experience. Um, Apa Guard, you can certainly put on at a higher temperature, but, you know, if it's too high, I've had people report queen shut down, brood damage, things like that. I mean, to, you've, got to, you've got to think, it's a thinking man game or a thinking person's game you got to think your way through it and you've got to um, you know the goal is not to hurt the bees but to control the mites and yeah. it's a sketchy thing it's not it's not cut and dried it's not black and white it's very um, gray if you will yeah so Tim uh, I guess it's it's nine o'clock here on the East Coast uh, just um, I, I guess time flies when you're having fun Let's let's ask for the rest of the year. Anything else going on? Um, things things we should be planning for this time of year. Well, um, we've got um, uh, goldenrod flow is right around the corner. Um, you need to get do something to control varroa if you're in a goldenrod area, and get your supers ready to go. One of the things I've talked to beekeepers about, and I, I've actually seen this in New Jersey, is uh, colonies go through a dearth period, Kevin, where there's no incoming food. And what happens is, what happens when there's no incoming food? Queen stops laying. Yeah. Brood nest dries out. There's no reserves in the brood nest. Sometimes you'll even see borderline starvation. Then all of a sudden, goldenrod kicks in second week of September. And what do the bees do instead of producing the crop? Is they, they rebuild themselves. Okay? I really believe that some strategic feeding, if you're in a goldenrod area in August, early August, mid-August, even if it's a gallon or two, to keep that queen stimulated, keep that brood nest juicy, yeah. um, so you have bees ready to roll when the goldenrod hits is an important thing um, if you want to make a goldenrod crop. So that's a strategy that a lot of beekeepers don't consider, but in New Jersey, as, you go, as we go through the dearth period, it's important to do that. A little bit of strategic feeding, so that your colonies are ready to roll when, when the fall flow comes will be beneficial. I, I am so with you. In fact, I, I just was talking to Sharon this week and said, I don't have enough feeders for all my hives. And I, the, the nectar flow seems to have dropped about the middle of July mm -hmm. here in our region, and we won't see it again till the middle of September, and I'm going to feed my bees. I, I think new colonies... They've grown into the second box, but I've noticed that they don't have any. You pull a brood frame out, and you're looking at it, and the upper right-hand corners are not loaded with nectar like they should be. 
They don't have any. They're dry, to your point. I think you're absolutely spot on on that, and I'm going to give them a little bit of feed. I, I hate feeding sugar water. I hate it. It's like goes against every core fiber of my being, but I'm going to feed this year because I want all my bees to overwinter, and I want to have 12 hives in the spring. It just has to be that way. Well, Kevin, let me tell you, in my, in my personal experience, there's been years where there was no fall nectar flow and I did not feed because of exactly what you said. And I'd have small clusters of old bees going into winter and have very high death loss. You know what? Strategic feeding, where I live, there is no fall honey flow 99% of the time. Yeah. I have to feed the fattened bees for the winter. And, I, and since I've been doing that, my death loss has gone way down because those bees are got plenty of resources. They got a lot of young bees going into winter because I feed in order to make that happen. People that keep bees like where my buddy Bob does in Mercer County and places like that generally don't have to do that. But here's what I'm going to say, Kev. I've, I've seen where I've made up um, nucleuses or splits late in the season. I want to say by late in the season, I mean second week of June third week of June and those colonies then go into a dearth period and they're just like babies if you don't baby them you know you wouldn't expect a, 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 a eight-month-old baby to eat steak and uh, celery you follow what I'm saying right yeah um, you know you got to nurture that kid and it's the same thing with a new split off made this year or a nucleus made this year they need to be nurtured so they have the best chances whatsoever of successfully wintering and I, and I think that actually, if I have to think back, that explains that hive situation that I told you earlier where the queen had just started, she was going, and now there's nothing in there. They've got nothing to eat. I don't know what literally happened to them, but I, I can't, you know, the only thing you can think of is they absconded, but there's nothing in the box. There's no eggs, no anything. So I, I don't know, but I agree with you. So, Tim, yeah, it's... I, I, just, uh, I, I just, just a minute, I just had a observation hive at the beneficial insect lab absconded on me last week because it ran out of resources had no food uh, and the whole thing up and left and they will leave brood if they abscond they'll even leave sealed brood in the colony and leave because they're on the verge of starvation okay that makes sense hey you know today I was out in my yard and I saw something that I saw last week which is just every hive boiling with bees coming out orientation flights it seems like the whole colony is out flying in front of this have, have you seen that in your apiary oh yeah a lot of times it's in three o'clock in the afternoon it seems like exactly and it's the it's the next generation of foragers starting to, to test their wings and memorize their location yeah I've seen that a lot lately the last couple times that I've been out there I've seen it and the other day it was really interesting they'd go out They'd fly up, they'd come back over the hive, and then they'd come back down. Didn't go inside, they just kept flying that loop. They weren't flying circles like you usually see when they're orienting up in the air, but today, just a huge cloud. You would have thought all of them were swarming. Yeah. And then an hour later, they're all back inside the hives. It's pretty cool to watch. It is cool. And that reminds me of something that you, you mentioned earlier about swarms and about... Um, maybe not needing to treat a swarm the first year and I always thought that was the case logically speaking a swarm would leave for oomites in the colony it left generally speaking I mean that seems logical to me Kevin right because they're not bringing the brood with them yeah and and where does a varroa might want to be in the brood however and, and this is only one but I had a gentleman in Pensacola New Jersey last year call me up wanted an inspection I went out there the swarm had been put into a hive for about 20 days, 25 days before I got there. And when, when I broke that hive apart, the burr comb was loaded with varroa mites. So for whatever reason, that swarm had plenty of mites with it when it came. And within, I was there 28 days after he hived it in a box, and the burr comb was loaded with varroa. I mean, I you could see five or six mites if you look through the wax into the next cell over. It's crazy. I, I'm at the point now where I don't trust anybody but myself, right? I am going to go into the brood. I am going to pull out my quantity of bees, and I'm going to look for their things, and, and I'm just going to do that. I, I don't care if it's a new hive, an old hive. 
I don't care. I want to know whether there's mites in there, and I'm going to treat if I have to. That's and, where I sit. And the thing to add to that, Kev, is I was just talking with one of the staff members of the Be Informed Partnership, and they would recommend that you do an alcohol wash or a sugar roll today, and a week later, same hive, do it again, because you're sampling different bees each time. And um, if you get zeros over three weeks, chances are you don't have a big issue. But you may get a zero one week and a ten the next week, and then you better you better second guess yourself as to whether or not you have an issue or not. Yeah, yeah, that's true. It it all depends too upon where you take them. And uh, to your point, I, I know beekeepers who are taking them at the entrance. They they've got the wrong concept. You have to take them from the brood. Uh, that's all there is to it. Let me just tell you personal experience. Last year. Um, I treated everybody with either Mitoway Quick Strip or Apigard, and I wanted to know how well it worked. And that was primarily because my, my pallets have screens underneath them. Uh, probably two thirds of them have a screen bottom. Now, so I'm putting a treatment on, and I have no way to close that screen. You follow what I'm saying? Yeah, so I was yeah. concerned about that. So I went ahead, and in the first week of September, I started doing alcohol washes. And I was finding my my number of mites per hundred bees for one treatment was up in the range of seven and eight. For the other treatment, it was down below below two. So um, that had me nervous, Kevin. And I went ahead and followed up with another treatment because I, I knew that eight per hundred is way too high to expect to make those bees through the winter. Um, so. Really, a take home for, for the beekeepers who are listening to this is after you've done some sort of mite control, whether it's splitting, whether it's you know treating, whether it's whatever you care to do, it's so important to look and check and be vigilant about that because if you do it early enough, you still have time to, to, to hopefully reduce the level. If you wait till October to do it, it's way too late and the damage is done. Yeah, agreed. So, Tim, uh, that seems like a good place to leave it. I really enjoyed having you up on the podcast here. I would like to see if we can make this a regular thing where you come in and just uh, talk about what's going on in the state of New Jersey and just join us in general beekeeping topics. We, we talk about all kinds of things on here. I'm not sure how much you follow along. I know you and I talk offline sidebars and stuff about different topics, but uh, it's really been a pleasure to have you on here and to hear your insights. And I'm I'm also interested in if you could just come back and just keep telling us um, what you're seeing in the state of New Jersey because that's really important for people to know what you're seeing in the trenches and, and the things, uh, the messages that you're trying to get out there. Kevin, I, I can't thank you enough. I, we talked about this probably for the last year. Yeah. Today we had a little bit of technical difficulties but finally made it happen and I, we have the technology now, I have the technology now and I'm more than willing to do this because you know education is where it's at and being able to tell people what what is out there, what I see happening, you know a lot of times people in, in this generation people feel things and I, I hesitate to feel things because I want to know facts, <laughs> I don't really care about feelings that much. Yep. Okay? Um, <laughs> You know, a lot of times people want their reality to actually be reality, and I'm all about saying this is the reality that I'm seeing as I go from beekeeper to beekeeper to beekeeper to beekeeper, which is why I tend to be very opinionated and dogmatic on certain points. I'm more than willing to come back, and, and I certainly enjoyed doing it, Kevin. And as you said um, when we spoke yesterday, before, before I know it, the time will be over, and sure enough, that's the case. Yep. Yeah, this went pretty quickly. So again, thanks for coming in. And for those of you who are listening to the audio version, you can go over and see the, I should have said this up front, but I'm saying it at the end. There is a video version of this, right? So if you wanted to go watch it that way, you can go over. The best place to go is the Beekeepers Corner podcast homepage. It's www.bkcorner.org. Any questions for myself or Tim, you could send me an email and, uh, it's Kevin at bkcorner.org. You can also follow us on Facebook, Beekeepers Corner. Uh, it's facebook.com slash beekeepers corner. And Tim, I, 
I know that we've talked for a long time at trying to get this going, and I'm really, really pleased that we had a chance to record an episode, and I look forward to doing more with you. So thanks a lot for coming in. Hey, you're welcome, Kevin. I'm looking forward to it, too. So thanks, everybody, for watching or listening, and we'll catch you next time on the Beekeeper's Corner Podcast. <laughs>